Amen. Well, good evening again, everyone. Uh, it really is fantastic to be able to share with you tonight. Um, just to say, it's been an interesting little time. Uh, some of you may uh, not have heard, but John and Terry's son, uh, Chris and Lara, got married yesterday, uh, which has been an amazing thing and very special. And so we were uh, celebrating with them till the early hours of the morning. And then uh, Daniel decided to carry on the celebrations later on, and then Timothy after him, and Jonathan after him. So I feel in a slightly interesting space right now. If I just blank out, just wave, and I'll come back eventually. It only happened once at the 8 o'clock meeting this morning. It was slightly awkward, but everyone laughed and we got through it. So we're going to help each other out tonight, and it's going to be fun, engaging, and I'm sure beneficial for everyone. Uh, just to say, I'm really excited about this message that I get to do tonight. As you know, we're in this series, and we're looking at this question, why Jesus? Uh, and as we were looking at all the series talks, I somehow managed to get this one, uh, the more than the man. Uh, and I, I can't help feeling like I got the best talk. Uh, so I hope that I can do it justice, and uh, I'm excited about what God is going to do among us this evening. Uh, so this, this really is the big question, I believe, of Christianity. Was Jesus more than a man? Was he more than just a man? And as you know, we've looked at some of the different views that are held by other people in the world of Jesus. Uh, we've looked at the view of Jesus among people who are uh, Islamic. We've looked at the Jewish view. Uh, we've looked in pop popular culture. We've looked at the New Age view. Uh, you know, we've kind of seen everything from Jesus is a great concept for a person to, uh, gee, that was interesting, he's a great concept for a person, uh, to uh, oh, he's a prophet uh, and he should be revered. Those are some of the ideas that are out there. We also looked at the humanity of Jesus and how Jesus has took, uh, he took on flesh. He is like us in a sense in so many ways. We can see him as the example of how to live a life of, of godliness that he can identify with us. It's actually one of the things that, that Christian people tend to struggle with, this understanding that, that we can really identify with Jesus and Jesus can really identify with us. But for people who aren't yet Christians, that kind of is the view that makes sense. Well, of course he was a man. He, he was, if he was a man at all, he would have been a human. I mean, he would have done human things because that's what he was, unless he was more than just a man. And that is, as I say, the big question. But don't worry, I am the right guy tonight to tell you the answer to this difficult thing. In fact, you're very lucky to have me here. Um, <laughs> I have come down out of heaven to be with you and to do God's will among you. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so I have the right to teach you and to instruct you and to command you to obey my teachings. You may have heard of Paul or Moses. They long to see me. But before they existed, I am. In a sense, you can refer to me as Yahweh. I'm one with the Father. And if you've seen me, you have seen God. I am the only one who can give you eternal life. You know that God established the Sabbath after he created the heavens and the earth? I am Lord of the Sabbath. I will ultimately, in my glory, sit on my glorious throne and judge all the nations of the earth. And I will determine the eternal fate of every single person that has ever lived. That has been given to me to do. I have the authority to forgive your sins. Those sins that you have committed against God, it's me that has the authority to forgive them. Ask me anything in my name and I will do it. You can pray to me and I will hear you. I'm able to do that. Every one of you, you can start to do it right now. I will be able to hear you and to answer. And what you ask in my name, I will do that God would be glorified. The angels of heaven, they belong to me. 
And so does the kingdom of God. Now, obviously, that's not really true about me. (laughs) Although I had you going for just a moment, yes? No. Here's the point and the point that I wanted to make in doing this. Many people say that Jesus never really claimed to be God. And the Bible doesn't really teach that Jesus was God. We kind of read that into the passages. Well, I want to say to you tonight, the Bible in many ways makes it abundantly clear that Jesus himself understood that he was God and to be worshipped and served as God. And his disciples understood that he was God and to be worshipped and served as God. And the people who killed him understood that he was claiming to be God and that is why he was crucified. The many ways that we can approach this topic and it's massive and it's been debated for thousands of years and there's so many scriptures that we could go to and so many things that we could look at. We don't have time to do all of it tonight. And I want to, what I'm going to do this, this evening is to take four of the things that have really impacted me as I have wrestled with this. Is this what the Bible teaches? And I want to share, in a sense, my top four with you. Uh, but just to say that there are others. And for those of you who are here who kind of like to read and to read research and to dig a little deeper. Uh, We have a little pack and if you would like to do further reading, I can send that to you. You can just uh, email me or come and give me your email address afterwards and we'll get you the extra information so that you can dig a little deeper. So, but I want to, I want to deal with four of those key things with you this evening. And here's the first one that I want to look at. Jesus takes God's name for himself. And just to say, I'm not sure how many of you read about uh, Captain Context, uh, but Captain Context is a really great thing to read. Go and have a look online. It will benefit your life. Uh, But just to say, if we're to understand Jesus' words, the context is very important. And so I want to tell you some of the backstory to some of the things that Jesus says among the people that he's having conversations with, because it's going to help us to really understand what he's actually saying. And so we need to begin this discussion actually in Exodus with Moses. Uh, Moses is an interesting guy. Uh, He tries to bring deliverance to his people and his kind of own strength that fails. He ends up in the back of the desert, middle of nowhere, looking after sheep until he has this radical, amazing encounter with God. And God speaks to him from this burning bush and says, I'm sending you to bring deliverance to my people. And after, in a sense, God commissions him, he responds like this in Exodus 3, verse 13. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. It's an incredibly special thing that God has revealed to us his personal name in a sense. It's a great thing when you meet someone and you're able to get their name. And remember their name so that when you see them again, you can call them by their name. It's, there's something special about actually having that privilege of speaking to someone by name. And, and God reveals that to Moses. What's interesting in this passage, and, and excuse me for getting just a little bit technical here, but it's going to help us to understand Jesus' words as we step into the New Testament. What we have is God's personal name appearing in two different Hebrew forms. And and this happens often in the Hebrew and in the Greek language. You can have a root word, and depending on how it's used in the sentence, it takes on a slightly different form, but it, it means the same thing. It's the same word. It's the same root word. And so we have God's name, his personal name, appearing in its first person form as God is speaking about himself. When God uses his name and he's the one that's talking, it appears in its first person form. When he speaks to Moses and he tells Moses how Moses can speak about God, the name appears in its third person form. 
The first person is the Hebrew Haya. We think that's how they pronounce it. Easy to kind of remember. Haya. And it literally means I am. I am. To become, to exist. I exist. And the word in the third person is this word. We're not 100% sure how to pronounce it. But Yahweh. Y-H-W-H. And some of you may have heard of that before. And as you look in your Bibles, you'll notice that it's translated for us in two different ways. When God uses his personal name about himself, we translate it as I am, because that's what it means. In its third person form, though, you'll see that it's written as Lord in all capital letters. You might say, well, Jason, that's a bit weird. Why why did they translate it Lord if it's the same word and, and it means I am? Well, the reason is this. As the Jewish people would read the Hebrew Scriptures, they would come to the personal name that they would be able to say of God. And out of reverence for Him, they wouldn't say it. They would say another Hebrew word, Adonai, which means Lord, to remind themselves that God was to be revered. And so as we have it in our Bibles, we have it written as Lord in all capitals. And wherever you see that, that's the third person name, the personal name of God, Yahweh, that's being used. And just for your information, if you've ever heard the word Jehovah, uh, that's kind of a mashing together of the consonants of Yahweh and the vowels of Adonai. And they kind of put them together. It's a bit of a made up word. Uh, But it's helpful for us in the sense that we see that, that we need to revere God's name and refer to him as Lord. And here's the point of why I'm saying this. God's name means I am. It means I am. Whether it's spoken in the first person or whether it's spoken in the third person. The forms are slightly different, but it's the same name. And so now we jump into the New Testament. That's a nice picture. Should have shown you that, but we're moving on. uh, Jesus' words in John chapter 8. And and Jesus has just said something interesting to the Jewish people who he's with. He said to them, if you believe in me, you will never die. It's quite a radical claim for him to make. And so they pick up on it and they say, well, are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It's my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. But you have not known Him. I know Him. If I were to say I do not know Him, I would be a liar like you. Love the way he kind of mixes things up there. But I do know Him, and I keep His word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. And so the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And so they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself. How did he do that? I don't know. That's another miracle. He hid himself from them and slipped out and was unharmed. Essentially, what Jesus is doing is this. He is saying, I am Haya. I am the I am. And you can refer to me as Yahweh. I am the Lord. And it's little wonder that they picked up stones to throw them at him. Because if it were not true, it would be the most blasphemous thing that he could say. Does Jesus say that he was God? Well, he takes God's personal name and he says, that's my name. It's pretty emphatic. Next point is this. Jesus claims equality with the Father. And again, I want to fill in some backstory. And this time we go back into the Old Testament uh, to the book of Daniel. Daniel was a prophet uh, and he lived uh, around 600 years before the birth of of Jesus. He was a prisoner of war. Uh, He was taken into captivity as Jerusalem was sacked. He was taken into Babylon. And in Babylon, he has these visions and these dreams that God gives him. He does a number of other things as well, but but he has these visions. I want to pick up on one of them in Daniel chapter 7. It says this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. 
And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. This word serve him is quite interesting. If you have an NIV Bible, you'll notice that it's actually translated worship. And the reason for that is the Hebrew word here, pilach, literally means to serve a deity. It's a word for service that's only applied to deities. And that's why the NIV translates it as worship. But that's a sense what it means, to, to serve God, to worship God. That all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him, should worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. And his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And so Jesus takes on, as he ministers among the people of Israel, this title for himself. And he often refers to himself as the Son of Man. And it's not actually a reference to his humanity. It's a reference to the fact that he was something far more than just a man. And again, if we jump into the New Testament, like that. Oh, whoa, that's really interesting. And that's never happened before, but we shall not be phased. This is a recap of what we've covered so far. (laughs) There's that great picture we didn't look at. Okay, equality. Daniel, Daniel picture, and Jesus' words. Jesus, the Son of Man. We pick it up in Mark 14. And and Jesus is on trial. And all these accusations are, are coming against him. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer again the high priest asked him are you the christ the son of the blessed and jesus said i am and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power coming with the clouds of heaven and the high priest tore his garments and said what further witness do we need you have heard his blasphemy what is your decision and they all uh, condemned him as deserving of death. And they began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him and receive him with blows. You see, what Jesus essentially does is this. He says to them, I am the Son of Man. I am the one who was prophesied. I am the one who has been given glory and dominion and power and an eternal kingdom. And you are to worship and serve me as God. And so they kill him for it. Third thing that I want to show you. And again, I've I've pulled out some of the nuggets and some of my favorite verses, but there are more that we could look at. But some of the significant biblical authors that have actually stated that Jesus is God. They've actually stated it. And the first is Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet, again, in the Old Testament. He lived about 800 years before Jesus' birth. And he says this about Jesus, that he will be called Mighty God. Chapter 9 says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace. There will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. Mighty God. What about Paul? What a great character. What an amazing story of this man who begins the kind of Pharisee of Pharisees, Jew of Jews, persecuting the church, there to kind of murder Stephen and and trying to round the Christians up out of his zeal and passion for God because he didn't believe who Jesus was until he meets with Jesus. And God turns his life around and he sees Jesus for who he really is. And he's able to say, Jesus is great God and Savior. Titus 
chapter 2 says this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul knew who Jesus was. What about Peter? This man who on the night that Jesus was to be crucified denies that he even knew him three times. I don't know. I don't know this man. I, I've got nothing to do with him. Until he meets with him again after his resurrection. And Jesus restores him. And we see Peter become this incredible leader in the New Testament church. To the point where so passionate is he about proclaiming Jesus as God that they kill him and crucify him for it. But he so loved Jesus that he wasn't prepared to be crucified like him. But he asked, church history tells us, to be crucified upside down out of reverence for God. This is what Peter says. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then what about John? Perhaps the the man who was closest to Jesus as Jesus walked the earth in his incarnate state. He perhaps gives us one of the fullest treatments of, of Jesus' deity in a concise space that we have. This man who was so passionate about Jesus that even though they boiled him alive in oil, he would not stop proclaiming Jesus. So they exile him to this island called Patmos. And in prison there, he has the revelation that some of you uh, will know. It's the last book in the Bible. And he continues, even after that time, to come back to the churches and proclaim who he knows Jesus to be. We see this in John chapter 1. And for those of you who want to do some extra reading, I've got a great little uh, write-up from um, theologian Wayne Grudem, Dr. Wayne Grudem, on this first verse. I'm not going to go into that now because we don't need to. Um, But it says this in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Here's essentially what John is saying. Jesus, the word, is God, was God, was always God. Jesus is eternal. He existed before creation. And that He has created and sustains all things. He is the source of life. John knew that Jesus was God to be worshipped. The fourth and the last point that I want to make is this. Uh, And again, just to give some backstory and context, some of you may have heard of Doubting Thomas. Uh, Shame, poor Thomas. He actually became faithful Thomas, but he had a little moment of doubt. Uh, You know, not like any of us have ever had that happen, but we kind of all know him as doubting Thomas. But but Thomas is in this unfortunate situation where Jesus comes and and after the resurrection, he appears to all the other disciples and and Thomas misses out. And so they kind of come to him and say, Thomas, it's all true. We've seen him. He's alive. It's all real. And he expresses this to them. Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the marks of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will not believe. Almost the sense of a man. And he was, he was the only one who was prepared to go and die with Jesus. We see that in John chapter 11. All the other disciples are kind of umming and ahhing about it. And yet you kind of see just his, his kind of faith has been crushed through the crucifixion. He doesn't understand it. And Jesus does this wonderful thing with him. John chapter 20. Eight days later, his disciples 
or inside again. And Thomas was with him this time. And although the doors were locked, perhaps because it was nighttime or they were afraid of being found out, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he comes to Thomas. Put your finger here. See my hands. Put, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe, Thomas. Thomas answered him. We have this kind of statement and affirmation of, of worship to Jesus. My Lord and my God. And Jesus says to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. This is what's significant about this. Jesus doesn't rebuke Thomas's affirmation. You know, uh, we see later on in, in Acts as as Paul and the other apostles, they're going around and they're doing some ministry. There's some incredible ministry going down. And in one place, they're so amazing of these miracles that are taking place that the people think Zeus has come among them. And so they want to worship Paul. And they say, you can't do that. We are just men like you. Don't worship us. Worship God who has sent us. But Jesus doesn't respond like that. He affirms Thomas. And he even says for us, who maybe haven't seen the bodily resurrection of Jesus like Thomas did, there's in a sense a special blessing on us who do believe. Gerald um, Borscht, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, uh, writes this in the New American Commentary. It's a great commentary set. Uh, and he says this on this verse, Thomas's response forms the high point of confession in the gospel. And what it does is bring the whole gospel full circle from the prologue where it's emphatically stated, verse 1, that the Word was God, to this confession, not just that He was God, but that He's my Lord and that He's my God. And in a sense, we see, we see Thomas join in with what's always been happening in heaven. I'm going to invite you in just a moment as the team comes up to, uh, to do this. We're going to worship as Jesus deserves to be worshipped. But, but John, who was on this island of Patmos as he was exiled, he, he has this revelation, this picture, this window into heaven. And this is what he sees. He says, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits onto the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And all the living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshipped. And if Jesus wasn't God, what just happened in heaven? would have been the most unthinkable thing that could ever take place. If Jesus wasn't God, then all the angels of heaven just committed the most atrocious idolatry to worship the Lamb in the presence of the Mighty One. And yet the Bible affirms again and again and again that He is God to be worshipped, God to be served, God to be obeyed, God to be loved. God who saves. And so we're going to worship together now. And we do different things often in this time, which we we kind of call remain, where we make things open and free and people can leave and they can stay. uh, And we have time to, to minister to one another. I just felt that after this message, what we need to do is to come together and to worship Jesus and to minister to Him Because He is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our worship. And we're going to do that now. But before we do, I want to give anyone that's here an opportunity. Maybe you have never, like Thomas, declared to Jesus, my Lord and my God. You know all those things that I said about myself that aren't true of me? They are true of Him. 
He is the one. If you believe in Him, He will give you life. Life forever with Him. He will forgive your sins. He will cleanse you of all unrighteousness as you ask Him for forgiveness. And He is worthy of your worship and your life. And so when you close your eyes with me, and I just want to say, if there's anyone here tonight, and, and you want to make that statement of faith in a sense, you want to say tonight that, that I actually do believe that. I do believe that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Lord. And I've never kind of said it like that before, but I say it tonight. And I want Him to come, to forgive me, to cleanse me, to heal me, that I could know Him and worship Him forever. If, that, if that's where you're in, That's where you're at. I just want to invite you to raise your hand so that I can see you and pray for you. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front now, but I'd love to encourage you maybe to come and see me afterwards so that I can connect with you. And That's awesome to see that hand. That's wonderful. Is there anyone else that wants to make that statement? It's been amazing. We've seen people make that commitment at all our meetings here today. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we want to pray as your people. We are so thankful for what you've done. We are thankful that you've revealed yourself, that the great God of heaven would come among us and die in our place for our sin, that we could be forgiven and know new life with you. And Lord, I pray for this person and I pray for each one of us that you would come among us, that you would come upon us, that you would place in us a heart of worship that we would serve you as Lord, that we would serve you as God, and that we would be able to join with the thousands upon thousands of angels that nonstop give worship to the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Lamb who is enthroned, the King of Kings. We love you and we worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Won't you stand with us as we worship Him?